So now, ladies and gentlemen, that ends our first workshop this afternoon. And maybe we could all use some stretching <laughs> while we give the floor to Dr. Francis Van Gu. He's the Vice Dean of Governance and Student Affairs at the Faculty of Education. Dr. Van Gu, the virtual floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Very, I'm very happy uh, to be here. And uh, it is a great uh, honor to uh, introduce you the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Denise Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis is a family a physician who works in the mental health unit at GEO and is also the curriculum director and academic day director in postgraduate family medicine. Her workshop entitled, So Now What? Effecting Anti-Racism Change in Postgraduate Medical Curriculum will walk us through the development of an anti-racist curriculum and will then invite us to partake in a group activity where we will apply this knowledge to our own areas of interest as it, related, as it is related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. So welcome, uh, Dr. Lewis. And uh, now I um, give you the microphone <laughs> so that, um, and I wish you a very good workshop to all of you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to try and share my screen so I can get my slides up. I know it's been a long day, so I'm very glad that you're mostly still here. I'm looking at the participant number. I see there are 29 people. I'm hoping to have at least 25 by the time we finish. Um, right, so this is me. Thank you for the introduction. I had a slide with a little bit about me uh, anyways. so. I'm going to walk you through maybe a bit of my journey into how I became involved in education. I have attended a lot of universities. I owe a lot of people a lot of money, um, but it takes money to become a doctor, right? Or to become any professional. So I started out after high school going to the University of Waterloo to study kinesiology. And from there, I studied medicine in Liverpool in England. And then when I returned to Canada, I did um, a master's program at the university, uh, at McGill University. It sounds very much sexier than it is. Experimental medicine was the home for the new family medicine sort of um, master's program. So it wasn't quite experimental medicine, but that's where, that's the official title. And then I did my residency at the University um, of Ottawa. I was at the Briere site. When I finished, I ended up taking a job at the Children's Hospital and I thought I would just be there for a little, <clears throat> sorry for a little while, but it has been such rewarding work that I've been there since 2014. Um, when I left residency, I really felt a sense of being disconnected from the family medicine community. And so I wanted to become one of the fold again. And that's when I applied for the job of curriculum director um, and was very fortunate to get it. Sorry. <clears throat> so, there is a very lovely picture of two people that are very important to me. Those are my parents. That's Terry and Katie Lewis. And I put the picture up there to, to let you know a bit more about my education background. So my parents both started out in teaching. Um, my dad did not stick with it. He ended up becoming an engineer instead. Um, but the spirit of teaching never left him. And whenever my sisters and I had physics homework or chemistry or math, he pulled out a chalkboard in the basement and we did our homework there. I, I wasn't always such a fan of the chalkboard, but it got us through. Um, my, my mom continued on and became, well, she became a special education teacher and a res a re or a resource teacher and English as a second language teacher um, and got all the way up to the sort of level of vice principal designate in the Catholic school board here in Ottawa. And it's crazy, but so many decades later, I remember the names of some of her students um, because we spent a lot of time in her classroom. Um, whenever we had sort of PD days, um, we would go and help her in her classroom. We would help set up, we would help take down. I remember, you know, playing some instruments for the kids. I remember, well, this I don't remember very fondly, but 
whenever we would outgrow our toys, they ended up going to her students in her classroom. And I remembered her doing a lot of uh, late nights doing report cards at the dining room table, um, you know, and special things uh, to help her students, um, you know, be the best that they could be. And so, you know, I say all this to say that when we find ourselves in the world of education, we don't all have formal training. I am lucky because, you know, physicians are meant to teach the next generation. We have trainees all over the place, but not a lot of us have training in education. I am lucky because I did some formal training in that experimental medicine program where I was looking at, you know, assessment of learning needs in, in practicing physicians and getting some of the, you know, the theoretical underpinnings of education. But most of us don't. I was also lucky that on the other side of things, I got a lot of informal teaching about how to be a teacher. And so, you know, moving through my job as curriculum director, I sort of take that spirit with me that what you teach is important, um, but it's not, or I, I would say it's equally as important with how you engage the people that you're teaching. Um, and so that's something that I try to carry forward as I move through my work. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare other than I love my parents very much, which is why their picture is there. And I'm hoping today that, you know, by the end of this workshop, you're able to look at how EDI issues can be changed or addressed in the curriculums that you, you know, work with. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about the actions that we need to do. And I'm hoping to show that some of the actions are not as scary as they, they first appear. And that if you go through a sort of systematic approach to things, it's a lot easier to try to make some changes than you might think at the beginning. So hopefully, you know, I won't spend too long talking at the beginning, but I'll walk you through the steps that we, we took in family medicine. And then we'll get a chance to practice. So maybe if you've got some areas where you think you need to affect some change when it comes to anti-racist teaching or issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, you know, you can sort of practice going through the model and then we can come back and talk about it together. So when we're finished, hopefully you can describe a general approach to curriculum development and then be able to apply it, as I said, you know, to EDI content or related content. And then also some, you know, some other things, right? I want you to be able to identify the specific professional and personal considerations, you know, regarding EDI related curriculum development. I think there are some things that are special to this area that you may not experience when you're trying to do other forms of curriculum development. And I'd like everyone to be confident to try this at home. So my chosen approach, and this is an approach that is very, very, very popular with physician educators is a model by David Kern. He is a, um, I think an internal medicine physician in both, I wanna say Baltimore, Johns Hopkins Universities in Maryland. Don't quote me on that, I think it is. Um, I should know that, but anyways, it's a big school. Um, so he's held a lot of different titles. What I like about his model is that it's very practical. It's very intuitive. Uh, you can see the arrows are moving in all kinds of directions, meaning you can go from one stage of it to another. It's very forgiving in that way. You can always go back when you say, oops, I forgot to do this, or maybe I should go back and look at this. And it was developed for clinician educators. As I said, a lot of us don't have formal pedagogical training when it comes to education. And you know, having a model that is tried and true, that is widely applied, is something that is really useful when you are tackling this. So the very first step is about identifying your problem and doing a general needs assessment. You can look at what the problem is, what the current approach is, what the ideal approach is. And then you can move on to doing a targeted assessment. So in your environment, what are the things that your learners need? How is your learning environment conducive to this or not? Then you can move on to goals and objectives. And of course you can always backtrack because the arrows do go in all kinds of different directions. Everything is related. So you can figure out what your goals and your objectives are, broad ones, measurable ones, um, 
You can move on to what your educational strategies are going to be, what you are going to teach, and how you are going to teach it. And then you can try to figure out how you're going to implement it. And implementation is so much more um, complex, you know, than I, than I first thought before I started doing this work in this job. There's all sorts of levels you've got to go through: political support, you've got to get resources you know, address the different barriers that might be there, but there might be some facilitators as well, right? You've got to introduce the curriculum, you've got to administer it. And then the next part is evaluation and feedback. And so it's nice to not only evaluate or assess what the learners, you know, have acquired from this curriculum, but also how it works in the program. So this is, this is my, this is, this is the holy grail of curriculum development when it comes to clinician educators. It is used all over the world. It has been cited so many times and it really is quite, I'm gonna say easy. It's not easy to do. Doing the work is never easy, particularly when it's this kind of subject matter, but it is a very nice, um, nice way to guide the work that you do. Particularly, I find that when you've got subject matter that can be contentious and EDI related material is contentious. Uh, people don't even agree on whether or not systemic racism exists. Um, we know it exists, but not everybody will agree to it and not everybody will acknowledge it, right? So, you know, this kind of thing does become a bit contentious. So I'll take a walk through the different steps that I did. So problem identification and a general needs assessment. I'm incredibly lucky. My leadership is behind this 100%. In fact, this has come from sort of the top down. The Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa prioritizes social accountability and it's a sort of you know five year strategic vision. And the specific um, point in that strategic priority is that learners and faculty members truly understand the impact they can have on marginalized communities internationally and within Canada. And I think, you know, we like to talk about global health, um, you know, a lot as a sort of thing that's outside of, of Canada, but global health comes to us too. And it's not even necessarily global health. We need to realize that Canada does not always look the way that we think it looks. Um, you know, we took our cues from societal need um, and then, you know, our patients as well, right? So what is our patient population like? What do they need? And in family medicine, when we think about our patient population, our mandate from the college is to train family physicians that can practice anywhere and with any population. So we are looking at who lives in Canada. And even if we live in an area that may have fewer of a certain group of people, it doesn't mean that we don't need to know how to be able to care appropriately for that group of people. So, um, you know, this is just showing sort of different clips from the media. We know that this is out there. We know it's a problem. It's a societal problem. And then also reinforcing what our strategic plan at the Faculty of Medicine is. You know, before I go on, I should probably sort of situate where the, the, the family medicine is. So I don't know if everybody knows this, um, but when you finish medical school, you are a doctor, but you're sort of an undifferentiated doctor. You haven't specialized in anything yet. And that's where the postgraduate medical programs come in under the postgraduate section of the Faculty of Medicine. And family medicine is the largest program because, you know, there are more family doctors, you know, than anybody else. We train a lot of people. There are about, oh, I would say probably about 140 some odd residents at any given time in our program between the first year and the second year, sort of 70 and 70. It's just sort of ballpark figures. So at this stage, the people that we are trying to train, the learners we're trying to train are physicians. They have gone through medical school and they had, could have gone anywhere in Canada or in the world because we have international medical graduates. And so they're all gonna come with a different level of understanding um, different programs, different ways you know, of learning and different societies that they come from, just to sort of situate. So we had a, a, a big you know, sort, of, sort of needs assessment about what we should be doing. And my 
my program director approached me uh, in the summertime. It was probably about June of 2020. Um, and, you know, things were happening, June or July. Uh, right now, we know the trial of uh, the police officer involved in the death of George Floyd is happening right now. And I know it's going to be a very, very big trial. But at that time, there were a lot of protests happening. And it was becoming a very, very, uh, I don't want to say hot topic because that trivialized things, but it was becoming very topical. Even though it's been a problem that has been happening for a long time, it sort of, you know, seems like it took some real big international movement, you know, maybe for some things to rise a bit to the top in terms of urgency of trying to address the situation. Oh, so then we moved on to still in step one, but I needed help. Um, I was very hesitant, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later when we talk about the personal lessons, but I was hesitant. You know, this is not the kind of thing that you don't want to get right, and I am not an expert in anything other than being myself. So I, uh, I didn't even really have to advocate for this because I have such great leadership, but I, I really said we need to have an external consultant, look at the curriculum that we already have, and see where our gaps are. And so the curriculum that we already have takes its cues from the requirements from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And part of that is about cultural safety, cultural sensitivity. We have some Indigenous health um, specific competencies that we need to achieve in our program. Um, and so we had some cultural competency modules, but we didn't really talk about specifically being anti-racist, right? So our external consultant who is, uh, she's someone who's highly regarded in her profession, works at another faculty of health sciences in a Canadian university, um, has done work on the human rights um, museum commission, different things, right? So she's got expertise and it was really helpful to have someone outside of our program and who was also a non-physician look at our program. And so her suggestions were that if we want to fulfill the curricular objectives, and I'm going to broadly say the curricular objectives are producing anti-racist physicians at the end, right? Um, that what we do needs to be woven through the length of training because we are trying to incorporate anti-racist beliefs into the way that people practice medicine. And as has been mentioned before um, in earlier sessions, we are socialized, you know, in a country that has had quite a racist history, although we don't all know that it has had quite a racist history. Um, and so we need to actually explicitly say that. It needs to begin with a primer on the concept of race because everybody's at different levels. As I said, our uh, learners come from all over the place. They come from other universities in Canada, outside of Canada. So we wanted to be able to have um, a, a session where we give everybody the language to be able to uh, speak about the topic at hand and that we must not shy away from naming and exploring the concepts of whiteness and white supremacy, which is something I have never had any formal instruction in my life in all of my decades and decades of formal education in Canada and abroad. We have to recognize that language and the discussion of race and racism is political and it will change over time and over context. So we need to be able to adapt our curriculum as necessary. We need to discuss intersectionality. Um, we need to be able to discuss highlight systemic racism. There is a great um, desire to talk about unconscious bias all of the time. And we do need to talk about unconscious bias. But one of the issues when we solely talk about unconscious bias is that it makes it seem like some of this stuff is not organized and orchestrated. And we know that that is actually not true. We are not all walking around, you know, innocently doing things that would be considered <clears throat> racist or marginalizing, you know, people. Um, that's not the way the world works. So we can't solely focus on uh, unconscious bias. We need to be very careful about um, presenting the concepts of race and systemic racism in a Canadian context. We live very close to the border to the South. We are inundated with 
facts, data, historical references of things that have happened in the United States when it comes to race. And those things are very important and we have absorbed them in our lifetimes. But a lot of the time in Canada, we get to look over the border and say, well, at least we're not as bad as they are. And it's sometimes you need to just stop looking across the fence and say, well, what are we actually doing in our own yard? And I think it's very important for us to situate um, you know, any of this curriculum in that. And that we've got to provide an opportunity for reflective learning. So those were the big you know, suggestions that came through and I am really very grateful to have had expert you know opinion um, in sort of in what we should be doing what we're sort of missing and what we should be doing um, and also she was so generous and provided tons of resources to us um, and we have an ongoing relationship there is such a generosity um, you know when you collaborate with people sometimes that's unexpected um, but it's been really enriching in this instance so then we moved on to a targeted needs assessment and we thought, okay, well, let me ask our learners some questions, right? And let's talk to our residency program leadership. So we had a curriculum committee meeting where a lot of this was presented and got some feedback. And then there was also a survey that went out to learners. So, I mean, I'm not even going to go through the questions because there were a lot of questions, but this is just sort of an example, right? So. Was the proposed curriculum practical? Could it be integrated into a two-year family medicine residency? Because that's all we've got. We've got two years to take doctors from being general undifferentiated doctors to being family physician specialists at the end. It's a, it's a tight program, right? And so, you know, that will sort of lead into some of the politics of implementation later, but you know, whenever you add something in, you got to take something out or you or you reduce the amount of space something else gets. And, you know, that can be really contentious because you've only got a little bit of time to do this. Um, does anti-racism training in medicine fall under social accountability in medicine? And, you know, we had, you know, people say that it did for sure. Oh, sorry, seem to be missing there. Have you received any training, anti-racism training in your medical education to date? And we could see that, you know, about half, people, half of the respondents said they did. Some said they didn't, and some were not sure. And I thought, how can you be not sure if you've had anti-racism training? And to me, that means that whatever they may or may have, you know, been exposed to in the past really probably wasn't direct enough. Now, this is my last point. It's got a low response rate, right? And we know surveys, you know, you should be happy with you know, a certain percentage for response rate, but we have about 140 residents, right? So to only get 21 answers, and it was people who were either really invested in this or people who were against it. I have to say that the majority, the vast majority of, of, of residents that responded to this were in favor of doing this for sure. But there's always one person, you know, and I can't remember the comment that they made specifically, but they were like, this is just a, a gussy up version of the same response the university always gives. And, you know, it was quite negative. Um, but I, I think that's sort of what happens anytime you ask people questions, you either get people who really, you know, people who really want to answer the question, either positively or negatively. And there's a whole lot of people in the middle who either don't care, uh, don't have time to do it, didn't see it in their junk mail, um, you know, or feel like somebody else is going to reply, or they just will say, okay, well, I'm in the program. I'll learn whatever you teach me. Um, one thing that I found interesting is that in our res residency program leadership consultation, it was during a virtual meeting, but it was, it was synchronous. You could see people's faces. People did not want to speak up very much. Nobody, want, well, there were a few comments, but this is a kind of topic that people like to avoid as much as they can. And I did get a few comments uh, in my email after from people that had suggestions or had opinions, which were actually very positive and wonderful, but they just did not feel comfortable saying them out loud. And so, you know, that's another issue you'll find in implementation as well, right? So people, people might be on board, but a lot of times people don't want to say the wrong thing. So then we moved on to our goals and objectives, right? So essentially what we did was modify existing 
objectives. And I say objectives, but we're really competency-based, so I should be saying competencies. Um, and we try to format it in the same way as other of the key priority topics that we follow from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And one of the reasons we did that is because some of the work has already been done. And in fact, since we started this project, there is a supplement that came out for Indigenous competencies that will be you know, reviewed and added to this. Um, but it's a way of introducing new content that is recognizable to learners and to faculty. So it doesn't seem like some kind of new radical thing we're doing. We're actually reinforcing things that already we should be doing, but we're actually doing them this time. So you can see, you know, we have a list of competencies there. The ones that are in gray are sort of grayed because that already exists throughout our curriculum. That's part of our patient-centered clinical method. And that is woven through all of our communication skills and the way that we are supposed to, um, supposed to approach our interactions, encounters with patients. But there were a few other ones, um, you know, that we feel, felt we needed to add in. Uh, recognizing cultural norms, you know, but but knowing that a cultural norm does not mean that all members of a group are going to share the same beliefs. And if you are truly practicing patient-centered clinical method, you should find that out quickly when you're talking to people. Um, we also need to recognize that we've got our personal prejudices, assumptions, generalizations about race and racism. So some of our unconscious biases will come into there. Um, and that's where one of our reflective exercises might be very beneficial. We need to recognize the systemic and individual effects of historical and ongoing government policies towards Black, Indigenous, and people of color populations, and the impact that this has on their health status. We have to be explicit about this. And we need to recognize the connection between poor health and racism, naming racism as a social determinant of health. Not just saying, oh, well, people can be discriminated against and say, no, racism is a social determinant of health, just like socioeconomic status or other things. And of course, when you talk about intersectionality, there's a whole lot of things that can negatively or positively impact people's health outcomes. And then the last one um, that we wanted to add is recognizing that illnesses and conditions occur at different rates and present differently in different populations. And this is not trying to reinforce race because race is a social construct, but in a way it is trying to, um, as somebody alluded to in a comment before, I think Parisa, you were saying about one of the residents um, that was in your project, you know, dermatological conditions, right? Knowing more about that in the, the, the mainstream sort of population in white skin than in, in, in any other skin, right? And so we want to try and break down some of those, um, those uh, sort of, when we say lacoons in medicine, some of those areas, you know, where we have information missing. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, that we, we really should fill in the gaps, right? It shouldn't be up to me, you know, to go and look at, hmm, what does, you know, this look like on skin that's not, you know, the, my skin color or, or the color of the skin color of the majority of the population. Um, I always remember when I was in medical school, um, we had a discussion about acne. And I said that post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation was a problem. And people are like, that's not in the book. I'm like, well, it is a problem because, you know, you will treat You'll treat people who have acne and they may have certain scars, but people that have more melanin in their skin are usually going to have a lot more obvious, you know, hyperpigmentation after you've got, you know, different um, inflammatory skin conditions like acne. And I remember having to say it three times before anybody took me seriously because it just, it wasn't in the book and it wasn't on their radar because a lot of people are not coming to them, asking them, you know, for, well, you, you fixed my acne, but now my face you know, is, is 10 different colors. What do I do about this, right? And so when people don't have those lived experiences or see it in their friends or their family members, you know, if it's not in the book, sometimes people are like, well, that's not something I need to know. So next sort of looked at educational strategies. I realize this is really very small, but it's just to show that, you know, we look at our competency 
then we look at the different teaching modalities that we might use and then look at where it might fit in our curriculum map and what faculty development might be required to be able to get this going. So for example, we use small group sessions and simulations for some things. Other things we use workshops and there are sort of the number four, five and six, we thought everybody needs to get this at the same time, right? Number seven, where we're talking about different illnesses and conditions, that needs to be woven throughout everything. It needs to be incorporated into lectures, workshops, into simulations, and into bedside teaching. And I'm still not sure how we're going to achieve all of that, because that really requires a lot of buy-in from our faculty to be able to talk about these things. But I am hoping that you know, when we have residents that have experienced this kind of curriculum change, they may ask the question, well, how is this going to present differently in someone from this background. Um, and then our map just shows where it is. We've got unit-based teaching, we've got a behavioral medicine curriculum, we've got academic days, we've got some asynchronous materials, we've got our clinical experiences and where can we try and, and fit those things in? And then what faculty development will be required? And it's interesting because I thought, oh, external teachers probably for some of the big heavy topics and you know, our learners, really we're like, no, our faculty should be able to teach this themselves. If they're practicing physicians, they need to be able to talk about this. And I was really quite surprised by that. And I think so was our faculty. So it's gonna be some faculty development that has to happen there. Moving on to implementation. So this is sort of the stage where we are right now. We are developing the actual content of some of these workshops. And the most important thing for me was having a team, you know, to do some of this work. Um, the curriculum director is lovely position. I'm a, I, you know, oh, I'm a director. I am directing nobody. I am directing curriculum, but I don't really have anybody working for me um, in terms of content development. And so to be able to work with other people is wonderful. The, the downside of that is that a lot of things are volunteer positions when it comes to academia and you know clinician education um, and so you want to be able to pay people things and so there was some grant application you know action that was happening at the last minute to try and and be able to you know hopefully fund some of the work that people are doing there's also buy-in right so you've got to have your faculty members who are like i'm committed to this i'm going to do this I'm not exactly sure like how we are going to achieve a cultural change. It's, it's very easy to say these are the things that we want you to do differently, but organizational change, cultural change is really very different. I think, oh, there's a saying and I can't remember what it is, but it, I think it's culture eats organizational change for breakfast. Right, so you can do all the all of the mapping that you want to do about how you want to change things, but if the culture is still the way it is, you're you're pretty much out of luck. But we have a wonderful faculty development director who's working with me on some of this, and he is extremely committed. Um, and so I think, you know, having really strong people in positions of leadership is something that's really helpful in trying to make these changes. Um. And then there's collaboration across the Faculty of Medicine. This is a priority across our faculty um, and they've made it known. So I'm participating in an advisory committee on the undergraduate curriculum. You know, there are different workshops that they've been having to try and engage faculty members at the faculty level. So that has been something that I never thought I'd be participating in um, because I said, I don't consider myself an expert in any of this, but it's been very rewarding so far. And knowing that you've got your organization backing you on these kinds of social accountability changes is invaluable. My feeling doing this is that it is not all talk. There is money behind it and there is will behind it. And that is really invaluable. And feedback and uh, evaluation. This is in development because our content is in development, um, but it's interesting. We don't evaluate all of our sessions. I mean, we do, right? So residents will evaluate the sessions in a standard way, and they would evaluate these in a standard way as well, according to some of the, the things that we want to fulfill, um, particularly for accreditation purposes with the college. But 
the way that postgraduate training in, in, in family medicine works is that there is an overall development to competent professional at the end. So it's very hard to, to measure some of these skills. I think that um, looking at our general ways of evaluating clinical experiences and uh, trying to find, and this is very important, but trying to find, you know, some of the hidden curriculum around this where, you know, we might have opposite agendas or our residents might get, you know, information that, that, that does not mesh with what we are trying to teach them is important too. So we are looking at that. That's sort of the phase that we're in. But what I love about Kern's model is that the arrows are going in all different directions. I don't have to have all of the answers to this now. I go back to a stage and we can change something. It's very flexible. And so that's one of the reasons I really like using this model. So I wanted to talk about a few things from a professional point of view and from a personal point of view. When I was approached to do this by my program director, we had a very, very frank conversation because the first thing that I thought, um, and this is just between us and of course all the people who may view this recording, is that uh, I don't wanna be the black curriculum director doing black things, talking about black stuff. And like, I just, it was difficult for me because I knew it was a very big opportunity to effect change. But I also was very cognizant of the minority tax that Parisa talked about um, earlier and this idea that I'm supposed to somehow be an expert in, 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 in these sorts of things and, and I wasn't. Um, and my program director had supervised me as a resident and we had a very good working relationship. So we were able to have that kind of discussion that was really like, look, here are my, here are my worries, here are my thoughts. And then, you know, be able to talk about those things. It was a bit of a strange reaction to have, you know, in some ways, you know, as I look back on it now, I'm like, was it really a strange reaction? It, you know, it wasn't, it was and it wasn't, right? A lot of times we want to be really, um, you know, you want to be involved in, in affecting positive change, but I never thought of myself as an activist, right? Like I, I, I was firmly like, well, I'm doing this because it has fallen under my portfolio as curriculum director, but had it not, would I be trying to affect this change in the same way? And knowing my personality, I'm not sure, you know. Um, I've had increased opportunities. Today's an example. People want to hear some of what I have to say. So that has been, you know, interesting. Um, it's given me an opportunity to be a leader in, in some ways. And, you know, that's, that's great experience. And it has allowed me to continue to grow my skill set and my knowledge in, in curriculum de uh, development, you know, and given me a bit more comfort, um, you know, in doing things in an academically sort of sound way. I won't say, I won't say a research way or a scholarly way, but in a considered, you know, and systematic way. Personally, Mm, you know, I had to, as I said before, think about my level of comfort. All of a sudden, I was being asked to talk and to be parts of different groups. And, you know, it's interesting, you think about your identity. And I am a Black person. I've been a Black person since the day I was born. Um, but Black means different things to different people. The way people define themselves is very different. You know, there's Black with a big B, there's Black with a little B. I talk to you know people, friends, family. We've had lots of discussions well before this, um, you know, about these kinds of issues. And even people that I've known my whole life, we've gone to you know the same high school. We had very different ideas about what being black was, and we grew up, you know, less than a kilometer away from each other and went to the same sorts of schools. But it means very different things to different people. Um, you know, if I was able to reach out, you know, to members, uh, I'll say the community, but there is no one community, right? Members of my community and have some discussions that we've had privately and then say, well, now these are, are, are bleeding into work and sort of what approach should we take? Um, you know, I've had to think a bit about my privileges. I showed you a picture of my lovely parents earlier. You know, they're both professionals, engineer, 
educator, like I grew up very comfortably. Um, we, we had discussions about race in my house. Um, definitely. Uh, my sisters and I, what we even think about race differently, even though we grew up in the same house with the same parents. Um, we see things slightly differently at times. Sometimes we see them exactly the same way. Um, you know, thinking about my worldview, thinking about my lived experiences. And I realized in the end that all of these have been advantages when I'm doing this. Um, but everybody comes with their own worldview and lived experiences. You do not need to be a visible minority, a BIPOC, whatever term is you're comfortable with. We don't, you don't need to be part of that group to be able to think about these issues and affect change. In fact, you shouldn't be because at a certain point, you know, when my consultant said we need to think about whiteness and white supremacy and really name that and talk about it, it's a chance for everyone to have the kinds of introspection, thoughts, conversations that, you know, people from visible minority communities have been having their whole lives. Um, so, you know, I have to say that it's been a privilege to be able to do this, but it hasn't come without certain certain personal and professional experiences that I wasn't necessarily anticipating. Uh, and I'm being very honest with you about that because I think it's important. I think that we cannot look to, you know, people from the BIPOC community as some sort of, you know, altruistic, you know, saviors who are going to come in and, and actually affect change in curriculum. When we have the opportunity to do that, it's, it's wonderful, but it's not always gonna be met with the same reaction. Um, yeah. Anyways, it's been an interesting journey so far. So I'm hoping that we can take a little bit of time now to maybe go into some breakout rooms. I'm not sure if whoever is controlling this meeting can help me with that. Or we could just yep. use Jamboard. Yep, I uh, set up some breakout rooms. So Wonderful. So you'll all be whisked away into some breakout rooms. <laughs> And I'm hoping that you can think of an area where you might or could or hope to or need to make some sort of EDI related changes in your curriculum or a curriculum. And you can sort of work through current six steps in a very, you know, easy kind of easy breezy. This is my first thought about this and thinking about this in Kern's way. You could work as a group, you know, in pairs or by yourself and just jot down, you know, what you think your problem might be, who your, who, your, who, your, who your learners are, where you're trying to do this, what your broad goals might be, what, what tools might you use to you know, do a needs assessment, those sorts of things, right? If you're gonna implement it, like what are the barriers you might foresee or the resources you need or the political support or any of that? And I don't know if you've used Jamboard before, it's a Google app that lets you write things on sticky notes. And so you can put your ideas on sticky notes so everybody can see and we can come back hmm, maybe in about 20 minutes or so um, and then talk about, about the things that you might like to change if this model could help you in envisioning making that change because it's very concrete. Hopefully you'll find it useful. And then, you know, anything that you want to talk about any questions you have, any comments, you know, you might have any ideas you might have for me. I, I realize I didn't share the details of everything that we're doing in this curriculum, but I wanted to keep it as broad as possible, um, you know, because it's really about the process of actually doing the work. Because as people have said before, there's been a lot of conversations, but at some point you've got to actually start making some changes. Um, right. So maybe we could do that now. Thanks. So if most people are back, I'm going to just share this screen that I have right here quickly, which is um, looking at the Jamboard that some people did a little bit of work on. Um, first of all, thanks for all still being here. 448, I see what's happening, right? <laughs> a, few, a few minutes left. Um, but I, I wanted to know, um, how did you find thinking about working through some of the, you know, the different challenges, you know, that you all have? As I was moving through the different breakout rooms, I noticed some of the talk centered more on organizational change. 
than necessarily curriculum change. Um, and so I don't know if if that is, is a discussion you are going to have in the future or a workshop you're going to have in the future, because it is quite different, you know, from what I'm doing. But anyways, let's open the floor up to everybody. Any comments that you have, any questions that you have, any just general discussion you'd like to have? Well, not in general, about this workshop. I know earlier there had been some questions you know, um, in the previous workshop about, you know, what people found was missing in health education. And I thought if any of those commenters are still here, did anything that you hear today sound promising or, you know, like something that is addressing, you know, the issue that we have with, um, you know, looking at racism in healthcare? I can speak to that, Denise. It's, uh, it's Kim McMillan. I'm from the Faculty of Nursing. Hi, Kim. Uh, and we are actually undergoing a curriculum sort of deep dive. We're, we're redoing our curriculum and we want to take a very explicit anti-racist, anti-oppressive approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've been looking for tools or frameworks or models um, to spur some some um, ideas and get committees together on this. And this is this is a great uh, model that I'm going to follow up on. So I'm really appreciate, appreciative that your School of Medicine is doing this and that I had the opportunity to attend. Oh, well, thank you. Um, but this, remember, this is at the postgraduate level. So I can't yes. the School of Medicine. However, the School of Medicine is doing a curriculum overhaul right now as well. Yes, so and I'm in contact with them about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Um, well, if there's any, like, if there are any sort of questions that you have, because I know I didn't actually provide you with any real content today, um, you know, feel free to email me a little bit later. Well, okay, I won't say I didn't provide you with real content. I mean, the actual meat and bones of what we are doing in our workshops. And I've got to tell you, I'm working on one of them in particular myself. We've got people working on some of the other ones. But I was, you know, looking at some of the historical policies by our government and I am shocked and I thought I was somebody who knew you know a little bit about what was going on with these sorts of things and I cannot begin to tell you the amount of things that I have learned um, and I just was like every time I'm like how come I never heard about this before why wasn't this in uh, taught to me in school it's it's been such an eye-opening experience mm -hmm. um, and I think we really do have to get that granular and down to like the levels of where things started for people to really appreciate the problems that we're facing and why some of our patients and not even just patients, but everybody, because everybody in Canada is a patient, right? So why we are all, you know, experiencing health and healthcare in such different ways. That's the one thing I was telling one of the groups earlier, one of the comments that I got, um, from faculty was perhaps we shouldn't use the term white supremacy uh, in our discussions um, and in our actual curriculum. And my program director said, either we're doing this or we're not doing it. Like, we're not going to you know, try and soften the language uh, mm -hmm. to make people feel comfortable. People need to feel uncomfortable to really do some work and understand what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Uh, some of the, a lot of actually the nursing literature says we just need to call it what it is and we need to talk about white supremacy and the history of white whiteness in nursing <laughs> and in 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 all medicine because otherwise we're just we're not addressing the problem right there's actually a podcast uh on cbc and i cannot remember the name right now but it's going to be included in one of our workshops and it's about sort of the history of nursing and how it's been a little bit exclusionary because <clears throat> it's not <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. It's not just about how patients experience health and healthcare, but also people who have tried to become healthcare providers have had many obstacles put up, you know, in front of them along the way. And I think it's important to talk about that too, because when we reflect and say, we're not seeing people, you know, that look like X, Y, and Z, there's a reason for that as well. Um, and it's important for us to address some of that. 
One of oh. the things that emerged uh, in our group discussion in using the model was um, that uh, um, it's really important to be mindful that when we're at step one and step two in problem identification and targeting the needs assessment, uh, whose voices are involved, who's listening, what perspectives are represented or not represented, and to be really careful about that and the influence on number three, the identification of the goals and objectives. So that's one of the things that, uh, that, that came out of our conversation. Right, for yeah. Sure. yeah, may I make a comment also about the uh, white supremacy uh, element? Of course. Um, and I'm playing a little bit uh, devil advocates a little bit here. Uh, but um, I understand, I understand um, both perspectives in terms of uh, yes and no, we should use it or no. Um, but for me, when we talk about something very complex, such as issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion, I find, I find it very difficult to work with absolutes such as, yes, this is what we have to do. We must do this. We must do that. Uh, we must undo this. We must undo that. For me, it's very much related to the circumstances where I am. Um, when we're talking about, uh, if we think about um, developing or changing as a journey, as a process, people don't start the process at the same time, at the same stage. Some people start the process, you know, way in advance as in other people, and we need to be able to understand that, that that's one stage. Some people may not be ready yet. Mm -hmm. to manipulate, to address, to work with uh, the work uh, word such as powerful, such as white supremacist. Uh, not using it doesn't mean that we are sugar coding or whatever. In some circumstances, it means that we are just, it could mean that we are just being mindful of where the person is coming from. And we are trying to scaffold this person to get to a certain point where they will feel comfortable using that term and then the learning process of the journey will be uh, more effective. Because I have been in a situation where I tried to, in a way, impose that term. And basically what I had in return is basically people just shut down. And I could not, and I could not have a conversation or a discussion or mm. have a communication, an effective communication. Um, this is just an example, but and in some circumstances it might be great as well. But uh, to to use the term, but it's just um, yeah, as I said, I'm playing devil advocate, but it's just to nuance a little bit more uh, this idea. Right, and I'll I'll um, get to you in a second, Parisa. I do understand where you're coming from uh, you know it is it's a real consideration um at the same time uh, as i said to one of the groups i'm in a bit of a you know in a bit of a powerful position in creating these kinds of changes because you know our residents have never been residents before generally unless they've transferred but most of them haven't and so you know by by laying down sort of the expectations of how we want to practice family medicine and the culture we were trying to have moving forward, we have a bit more leeway in, you know, saying things that are a little bit, um, you know, more controversial or getting straight to the point um, because we think that that's going to achieve the objective in the end for the majority of our residents. We don't necessarily have the luxury of, of doing it individually. We would hope that that is a discussion that might be had with their primary preceptors. And then you really get to meet people where they are when it's sort of one-on-one -on -one situations. But in larger groups, um, we've decided that we're gonna take that approach. Um, but I really can appreciate uh, you know, what you're saying. Parisa, go ahead. Well, um, I just wanted to actually say that you're not being a devil advocate. You're actually presenting what we call the colonial approach to problem solving right in the colonial approach we want uh outcome 
And because we're so focused on outcome, we might actually compromise uh, process and leave many people behind because we celebrate success and outcome. So in fact, what you're presenting is a very traditional indigenous approach. And that's where we often, the institution and our social cultural um, values um, essentially reach a um, reach the tension because depending on what culture and uh, socialization you come from you value more the process as you just explained and trying to meet people where they are rather than focusing on outcome at the price of leaving certain people behind because we might say, oh, well, they're not ready yet. So that's not, that's, and I think this is something that we really need to change in order for us to instill curiosity uh, in, our, in our learners. And I think uh, in our particular instance of, you know, being able to create curriculum is we are um, setting the expectations. If you want to become a family physician, the expectation is that this is the approach you will take to all patients to be anti-racist with all patients. And that's, that's going to involve, you know, discussions using the language and the concepts that are really what um, how it's being discussed in terms of academia as well. That was part of the reason why we had a consultant uh, in the first place is because we didn't want to make these decisions outside of the way, the current status of where this sort of body of research is. So we're sort of in keeping with that. Um, part of the difficulties when you discuss really, I will say controversial subjects, although I really don't think this should be controversial, is that um, you know, you don't want to offend people, but sometimes people need to be offended to understand what is offensive. Well, I, I don't know if it's controversial or I don't even know if it's offensive. Um, I think there was one research that showed that, you know, diversity in a group makes people uncomfortable, but ultimately the decision and the decision making takes longer, <laughs> but ultimately what you what you come up with is more representative of the of uh, really uh, the group. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a there's a there's a price you have to pay to to be inclusive. And I kind of want to go to the, I know we don't have to wrap up, but just to go to a bit of a medical example, um, you know, there has been all lots of hand wringing when your doctor is asking people about suicide will make people suicidal. And that's actually not the case. The research has shown that, you know, we have to ask uncomfortable questions. It's part of our job. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think that we can expect, you know, our trainees to go out and be able to ask uncomfortable questions of people and not be able to ask them of themselves. And can I just add that sometimes we might need to, uh... Um, make distinctions between uh, what I'm going to establish in, in creating my curriculum, where I might say outright that we're going to be uh, addressing white supremacy, and then pedagogically or in a teaching with adults uh, decide to, to use an approach where I'm going to address the topic, depending on who I'm talking to, about how whiteness uh, uh, is often used as what is normal or how uh, what is considered real knowledge comes from whiteness and then the other stuff is folklore or tradition and and how there's a hierarchical and then say and by the way that is what is called or part of of course i'm i'm caricaturing and going too fast but and that is what we call white supremacy so if we, we, we fear in the people that we're with that using a word might make a levy de bouclier, might people, make people shut down right away, there are other ways to, to get to the word and to 
speak about real things. So, so maybe in, in the way that we're, we're talking about things, we're, we might not be talking about the same thing in, in where we're identifying things. I don't know if I'm making sense in you saying are. it that way, but I don't think it needs to, I don't think that the, the order in which we do things or the process needs to be a, a, a compromise. Um, as a, a teacher, I think of differentiation to be effective. So um, yeah, let me put it that way. Anyways, I do want to be mindful of the time. And so I thank everyone for coming and for staying. And I, I really appreciate being invited uh, to talk about these things. And I just want to leave you with, you know, you don't have to be an expert to get the conversations going and to start making changes. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. And that was a very engaging presentation. And thank you very much, everyone, for also uh, raising your questions. And we have a few more questions that they're posted in the uh, oh, chat box. Yeah. But yes, we're running out of time now. But thank you so much again. And um, that, ladies and gentlemen, ends our workshop event for today. So do we have final messages from Dr. Shitbin, Dr. Archibald? Sure. Um and thank you to our speakers today and all the attendees to, uh, for your commitments to equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Uh, a special thanks to the ELM team for all of your efforts. And uh, this event is possible because of your support, enthusiasm, and willingness to make change one at a time in this difficult era. So the message that was delivered to all of us by our speaker today is that it's now is the time to act and put words into practice. So I will leave you with this and uh, we are hoping to have uh, another event next time so stay tuned and uh, maybe you could follow us through our Twitter accounts to get more information or even on our Facebook. Until then, have a great spring and summer and cheers to you all. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Shitpin. And on behalf of the ELN and of the presenters, thank you so much again for joining us today. See you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.